Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another Minecraft discussion today. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and I am really excited to speak with you about um, to stop wasting your life minutes worrying. And so this episode is about how to break free from the worry loop and, re and return to the now. So I'd written a Psychology Today article, oh, I, I think this was in June, maybe, I don't know, anyway, this summer. And it was so much fun that I thought I'd bring it back up again since I'm kind of on this jag with talking about anxiety. I think maybe because it's the new year and people are trying to make changes, positive changes. And so uh, that's kind of brought me to this. So um, I start out by saying, you know, we wouldn't think of taking a hundred dollar bill and lighting a match to it, you know, and it's so true. Yet we often just spend our life minutes so carelessly you know we just aren't thinking that they are limited you know they're not in an endless supply so we can waste our life minutes on all kinds of things such as obligations we have absolutely no interest in and on circumstances and relationships that just no longer bring joy to us you know and, and we do it simply because we feel I don't know, like it's comfortable to do it it, it takes too much effort and energy to bust out of it or something I don't know but our life minutes are sliding right down the drain doing that. And then I say, you know, and it, as it would be uncomfortable to make the change, uncomfortable to break free and comfortable to break out of that ritual once a month lunch with a person you don't have anything in common with anymore, right? We continue to remain on autopilot, not being fully present. And, you know, there is nothing, nothing more dangerous than uh, autopilot as far as stealing our life minutes. We're just kind of zoning out in broccoli mode. There's just nothing worse than that. And what happens when we zone out in broccoli mode on autopilot is our life minutes just circle the drain, never to return again. And the thing is, many people aren't aware of, you know, only what we attenuate to, which is a sexy 14 karat word for pay attention, only what we attenuate to will make it into long-term memory. So when we're zoning out, thinking we're relaxing, which is not relaxing, it's just broccoli mode, we're actually losing those valuable life minutes because none of that conversation you're zoning out to or none of that time to yourself you're zoning out to, none of it's none of it is going to make it into long-term memory. So I'm going to talk about the two biggest ways we waste our valuable life minutes. And one of the big ways we waste our life minutes is by residing in guilt and regret from the past. When we do this, we just, we pull emotion from the past experience for one into the now which then corrodes the present moment like battery acid it just brings all that crap back into the now so we're miserable twice i mean it doesn't make a lot of logical sense we allow these old thoughts to uncover old feelings and then bang we're right back in that place again reliving the whole awful experience as if it were really happening um, again and to the brain it is the brain just loves patterns and each and every time we pull a memory, you know, out of this past experience off those, you know, dusty bookshelves of long-term mem long memory, it's kind of like an attic, right? It is first altered and then it's strengthened. And this, so this makes it easier to find the next time and harder to resist the temptation, you know, to do the search. It's like we're searching for it, searching for it. The brain's like, yeah, I found that horrible memory you were looking for, gets reinforced, and now it's stronger. That's how it works. So by allowing these unpleasant thoughts of guilt, regret, and that endless loop of woulda, coulda, shouldas into our consciousness, we actually reinforce the rumination process, which is just that going over all the old stuff we woulda, coulda, shoulda done, um, making, and you know, and, and making... It's stronger each and every time we do so. Another big way that we sort of allow our life minutes to slide down the rabbit hole is by pulling the future into the present with worry. To worry is re is to rehearse being anxious, actually rehearsing like it's opening night, been rehearsing for a long time, now we're going to be really great at it, right? Which makes no logical sense. Though anxiety can also be more complicated as it involves levels of neurotransmitters such as serotonin being out of whack. Um, there's also a large component of choice and effort involved with achieving a calm mind. You know, people don't like to hear that. You know, my, and my, you know, I have my wonderful, my just lovely, lovely, lovely Minecraft students. Um, sometimes they'll look at me like, well, you don't understand my mind. Yes, I do. It still comes down to choice. And so 
you know, obviously we're all wired differently. And so it's, and that is what it is. We sometimes have extra things to deal with and it takes more work, but there still is a large component of choice. And so professional treatment, sometimes medication can help tremendously. And uh, though sliding into the driver's seat is essential, sliding into the driver's seat is essential when it comes to, when it comes to improving our own mental health and well-being. That's just it. You know, and as many of you know, I teach a course called Minecraft, which is, um, you know, about becoming the boss of your brain. I have little buttons that I give to my students that say this on there. And so what I say to them the very first day of class is that basically there are only two choices when it comes down to it. Either we control our thoughts or our thoughts control us. And that's it. Sometimes thoughts come first and feelings second. Sometimes, and take that back. Thoughts always come first and feelings come second. And therefore, if we allow anxious thoughts to circle around in our minds, we then feel anxious, right? So thoughts first, feelings second, actions or behaviors third. That's just how it goes. And sometimes I'll say to my students that they're, because they get confused, I'm actually proud of them for this because it shows they're sort of demonstrating critical thinking. Well, they say, how about if I, you know, I think I forgot to lock my dorm room and I walk all the way back and I'm not really thinking and then I touch the doorknob and whatever and then it's locked and but I wasn't thinking the whole way there. I forgot how I got there even, kind of zoned out. Think about this. If you were to take, we'll say in class, I'll, I'll point to one of them and say, what if we took Jonathan's, you know, uh, what, what if we carved into Jonathan's skull with kindness and anesthesia and removed his very intelligent brain and put it up on the shelf in formaldehyde, like in a fishbowl of formaldehyde, what would he be feeling? And they look around like it's a like it's a trick. What would he be thinking first? What would he be feeling second? The answer is nothing. Why? Because it all starts in the brain. So, and I'm proud of them because they're thinking about automaticity and those, you know, those automatic thoughts. But without the brain, you don't even have those, right? We don't. There's nothing happening. So, um, so I'll ask them. Either we control our thoughts, or our thoughts control us. And which is more pleasant? And right away they'll say, you know, obviously controlling our thoughts is more pre- is more pleasant. So here's, here's the thing is that um, if we allow anxious thoughts to circle around in our minds, we will then feel anxious. If we allow some pissed off thought from 1972 or 1987 or last week to circle around in our mind, and even though the incident's long since over, we are immediately pissed off again because the brain does not know the difference. So basically, the more we allow this, as far as anxiety goes, the stronger the worry loop um, becomes, and the more we, we become prisoners to our negative self-talk. So here's the thing, becoming the boss of your brain, which is what I say to my mind crafters, is the key to happiness and living your best life. I mean, that's it. You know, it, it's interesting that we, we don't take time to nurture the brain, which is the most important organ we have, this wonderful three pound, you know, organ that just guides our lives. You know, we'll, we'll get a houseplant and nurture that, but we don't give the brain you know, even a fraction of that attention. It, it's just, it's incredible. So 10 ways to manage the anxiety chatter and save your life minutes. This is how it goes. Number one is to realize and acknowledge that you are the captain of your own ship. That's it. And only you can steer your life in the direction you would like to go. A lot of people forget that. They just, they kind of sit back in passive mode, not realizing it's like a blank canvas that we can paint on. Uh, Number two, understand that anxiety chatter is irrational Um, in the vast majority of the time. Challenge challenge these thoughts by fact-checking. When we allow these thoughts to just roll through our minds, remember, the brain loves patterns. So the more we allow this, the stronger they get, as we said earlier, and then they keep coming back to haunt us. We've got to fact-check and then, and then, and we don't want to let them roll through our heads for longer than 17 seconds. That's a thing. If you get cross over into the 18 seconds, it's much harder to get rid of them. Number three, make a list of the controllable versus the uncontrollable right away. Throw, right away, throw away the list of uncontrollables and then let go of that list. It is a gigantic waste of life minutes to give it any thought whatsoever. Okay, that's it. And then go through each of the controllables and come up with a plan and, and a realistic timeline. Then let this go too. And there is, I'm thinking the 12-step program. I think it's St. Richard's Prayer, but it's also called the Serenity Prayer, right? Which is basically about making these lists and learning, asking for the, um, 
strength to, con- to, to control the things we can um, and the wisdom, I forget the rest of it, and the wisdom to know the difference, the wisdom to know what to let go of and what to try to get a plan for and then let go of that too. So then number four is remember the mantra as I think, so shall I be. The thoughts we allow in dictate how we feel. When you change your thoughts, you change your life. It's really that simple. Um, and then number five is be aware of avoidance behavior and work hard to reduce this the best you can. For example, avoiding a situation because you feel anxious, such as class, work, or a person. I have this, I see this a lot on campus. And I also, sadly, I watch it blow up. And, and, and when I can grab a student earlier on and have them come sit for a little heart to heart in my office, we can often nip it in the bud. Um, because the thing is when they, you know, they, it's rolling through their mind. Oh, I'm anxious. I'm anxious. I, I missed one class and I'll be embarrassed. I'm going to miss this one. And then there's immediate relief, which is how, why it's reinforced. So they have immediate relief missing the class and have to deal with the professor or walk in later, feel embarrassed. But, and then there's obviously a half-life because it, it gets, it's re it's reinforcing that avoidance behavior. That's not healthy is reinforced. And then they, they kind of, dig themselves into a huge hole that they often can't climb out of unless they reach out early or we notice early on and kind of pull them in. So, so as they say, the only way out is through. So each time you cave into this, again, it strengthens the behavior, makes it even stronger. This may not be easy at first, though it will get become easy with commitment and practice. The only way out is through. That is it. Number six is to understand that anxiety is a brain thing. And therefore, it's not your fault. Th- not not your fault. So that's the good news, right there. However, it does not mean not to take accountability. So number seven uh, says that said, remember that happiness is still a choice. Though you may have something extra to deal with, such as anxiety, depression, ADHD, or whatever, it's still up to you. And this means that it may take more effort to keep up in the race, but you can do it. Stand tall, shoulders back, and keep your eye on the prize. Um, number eight is when the worry loop starts, talk back to it with, it's not me, it's OCD, OCT, sorry, it's not me, it's OCT. In parentheses, I have obsessive compulsive thinking. And I did this intentionally because you don't have to have OCD to kind of get what we're saying here, because I think the majority of the world has experienced an an unwanted, intrusive, obsessive thought. I mean, even the Zen monks have probably had a once. Maybe that's why they chose to become monks. Who knows? But I think it just normalizes it instead of having it sound so huge. And it is really huge for some people. Absolutely. But it can also be like most things, life's on a spectrum, right? So it can be somebody who's a little nervous, likes things a little organized, cares about germy stuff a little bit, all these kind of stereotypical things likes things on even numbers. And then there's, and then there's the whole other side of that, which uh, like has a difficult time getting out the door, rituals, misses job interviews, loses work, loses, you know, uh, fails out of school because they can't get out of that house without doing their rituals. Then there's the whole middle, right? There's the whole middle. So hence OCT. So when that worry loop starts, talk back to it with, it's not me, it's OCT. So this will remind you that you are not your anxiety. It is separate from the person you are. And what's good about this is that it's a real shame buster, right? Because if it's my brain and not me, it doesn't mean we're not taking accountability. We said that though, that the, the good part is that it's, it's not, there's nothing wrong with us. This is a brain thing. Like you wouldn't say to somebody with diabetes, boy, what a loser, you know, they have to, they can't eat, eat any carbs and they have to take insulin and, and exercise religiously. Geez, like what's the matter with that? Like who would say that, right? No one. And so somebody with anxiety who has to maybe take some medication for a while or maybe for longer and see a therapist and get some life, you know, strategies going, it's a brain thing and that's it. So it helps to shame bust. We're not flawed. We're not defective. We're not, you know, we, we are enough exactly as we are. We just have this something extra to deal with and that's it. Okay. And then number nine here is realize that the brain can absolutely be rewired. This is the good news to think and to do what you would like. Much like a sea lion is trained to do tricks at SeaWorld. Really, it's true. It takes commitment, lots of consistent practice, and and applause. Throw yourself a fish when you have a small success. Seriously, 
normalizing, not, not making fun because so many people, so many people, um, it's important to normalize because obviously anxiety is huge. I mean, so many people are struggling with it. Spectrum thing. Remember from a little nervous to, you know, really having, a, a, you know, uh, incapacitated sometimes. And then, then there's the whole middle people who are really, it sucks the life out of them all day long to hold it together, go to work, uh, do all the adulting and they're, and they're, and they're doing it. And from the outside looking in, it looks like they're, they're, they're doing that. They're, that they're doing just fine underneath it. They're, they're freaking exhausted. Right. So there, here's a story that, um, I share with my Minecrafters also. And it's, it, God, it was so, it was ages ago because I'm a fabulous 58 and I believe he is 51 or two. Anyway, there's a speaker at my youngest brother-in-law's graduation years ago that has stuck with me ever, ever since. And the speaker, the speaker was a professor at this New York college and had several extra things to deal with in his own journey. Um, I remember that one of them was dyslexia and the, and another one was anxiety. And I'm pretty sure there was a third, but I don't remember what it is. Uh, remember this is, so this, this goes back 30 years ish, more, a little bit more than 30 years actually. And this professor was older then, which means there were no, there were no, you know, uh, IEPs and 504s and paraeducators and one-on-ones and all that. So he did this loop-de-loop thing when he showed how he made it on this journey, Never mind the bullying and everything else. And so he was so impressive. Anyway, he spoke of, of his challenges with earning a PhD and arriving at his success. And he compared this to a high school or college track meet. God, I remember this like it was yesterday. Um, you know, he, he then asked us to picture all the different teams lined up behind the white lines waiting for the gun to go off to start the race. And he said to look around at all the different, you know, colored uniforms and heights and body types of the runners. And it pict- I picture these invitationals because a couple of my kids ran track and like a million, there were, it's very colorful, a million, you know, kids, um, you know, wearing purples and blues and yellows and blacks and all kinds of different colors put together. And some of the runners would, would you know, uh, quickly be out in front of the race after the gun went off, obviously. And there would be a pack in the middle and then some kind of trailing behind as they were in it for social reasons sometimes or just to keep in shape, you know, just be part of the crew. So, yeah, you had the beasts out front, right? So then he says, he said, picture a few of these runners with a 10-pound weight belt underneath their uniforms that no one else can see. Picture that. Somebody in their purple track tank top, somebody in their you know, red tank top, and you cannot see the weight belt underneath. So the only the, the person knows that they certainly feel it, right? But nobody else knows. And on that weight belt, you can write the wordings or picture the word anxiety or ADHD or bipolar or addiction or whatever. Okay. And in these, these track runners, they're running the race, you know, with everyone else, but no one knows how much harder it is to keep up. Nobody gets it but them, how much harder it is to stay in that race. And so this really stuck with me, you know, um, as I thought it was a fantastic metaphor for life. And for those of us, because as you know, I'm a fast mind clubber. I don't say ADHD, I've renamed it. So uh, to be the fast mind club. Um, and we may have to, we uh, may have to be more committed and work harder than other people to achieve a calm mind, inner peace and happiness. But you know what? It's still up to us. That is the bottom line, like it or not. It, that's true. No matter what you're dealing with, it's harder, it sucks, and it's still our, our responsibility. And, uh, and all, you know, to reach out for support, because, you know, truthfully, with support, most of us do just fine. So the choice to be happy is ours, and it begins with, it begins with learning to become the boss of your brain. Um, as we think, so shall we be. Well, I have to tell you, I love this discussion because my, Minecraft is my baby, as they say, the course I designed for uh, Champlain College. And uh, th- I just loved having this, this conversation. So I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, just say this is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful northern Vermont. Have a mindful, worry-free day.